Hi, I'm Nick Monfort, Professor of Digital Media at MIT, and I'm glad to be with you virtually today, and we'll be glad to take your questions after this video visit. Today I'm going to talk about text-based interfaces in creative computing, and specifically about three different categories of work that have been done. Uh, first, the chatbot or conversational character. You're familiar with Eliza already. Uh, secondly, uh, interactive fiction or text adventures, and you know about uh, the first one of these, adventure. And then uh, what are more recently called bots or Twitter bots, and I'll mention some examples of these and ways that their textual output um, appears in a different context from these earlier two works. Um, I'll also tell you a little bit about my experiences with these. When it comes to chatbots, I didn't know about Eliza until later on. I met a commercial piece of software called Raptor in 1986 that was available for home computers like this one, the Apple IIc. Um, but the most famous chatbot is certainly Eliza, Joseph Weizenbaum's creation that was documented in 1966 and uh, one that Janet Murray described as the first computer character. Now, there's a lot of controversy, a lot of discussion around this particular character, which simulated a Rogerian psychotherapist, reflecting the questions or anxieties or statements of uh, whoever was typing to it back to that person without really uh, understanding anything in any uh, significant underlying sense. Um, and the uh, amazing ability of uh, this system to have a plausible conversation of sorts, um, but a sense that quickly goes away when you realize that um, all it's doing is acting as a sort of uh, mirror or a blank slate, uh, is what's known as the Eliza effect, something that Noah Warwick Fruin discusses in his book Expressive Processing. Um, now, Andrew Stern and um, myself um, wrote some about Eliza, did a presentation on Eliza in which we talked about how um, it succeeded for several different reasons. One of them uh, is that it was very culturally resonant. It had to do with something that people cared about, uh, psychotherapy. Everyone had an opinion whether uh, they were a New Yorker in psychotherapy or someone observing this via Woody Allen movies from elsewhere. Um, it was also, however, that uh, uh, this system um, was re-implemented by people. It was simple enough that you could put it in a basic programming book. Someone could type in a version of this program that did pretty much the same thing as the original, and it could be understood, it could be modified, it could be played with. And that, I think, was an essential element to the success of... Uh, of Eliza. That was one of the reasons, beyond cultural resonance, that uh, it became part of the popular consciousness. And um, however much um, people might think that Eliza uh, is a very stupid system and uh, is a, a, a failure in terms of creative computing, um, it's uh, very, very widely known and very influential. Um, I'll also mention that when people first interacted with it, they did it via teletype with uh, ink on paper interface. Um, and uh, when we move along to interactive fiction and text adventures, many of the early ways that people played um, early text adventures were also via ink on paper. Uh, but the way I found out about them were through home computers, like this Apple IIc. I had an Apple IIe, a compatible computer that looked different. And um, uh, oftentimes, uh, using a television like this one, a uh, cathode ray tube television that really wasn't made for textual display in the first place, but was a cheap type of interface or display that could be hooked up to the home computer. Uh, text adventures are related to conversation. Um, they came from a tradition of tabletop role playing from Dungeons and Dragons, uh, but they're also literary artifacts that are informed by uh, being actually made available in bookstores during the 1980s. Uh, by being published in different literary genres. So Infocom, famous publisher of, inf of interactive fiction, um, had mystery and science fiction and fantasy and humor titles. Um, they seem to be a lot like 
novels um, or interactive fiction, and that's how publishers uh, describe them. But I consider them uh, to be riddles. I consider them uh, primarily to offer something um, systematic, something hard to understand, but something that rewards the player, the interactor, the reader, um, for pushing through and getting to that level of understanding. So here I'm thinking of uh, literary riddles of the sort that someone like Emily Dickinson wrote, um, not Why Did the Chicken Cross the Road? Um, and I wrote about this um, in what's now a book of uh, some antiquity, Twisty Little Passages, and more recently uh, there's a fine documentary on interactive fiction called Get Lamp that Jason Scott produced. And again, with interactive fiction, uh, making one's own interactive fiction is part of the story of this creative form. And uh, people do it in sophisticated languages like Inform 7, but even if you were to try yourself to write a Python program from scratch, um, it would be a big challenge. Uh, I don't think it would succeed as easily as you might, uh, as you might guess, uh, but you would learn something about what interactive fiction is, what it does, what it requires, um, and you can also take existing code and modify it to work with this. Um, so to move along to Twitter bots, or more generally bots, um, a form that came about uh, initially when people wrote programs, hooked them up to tweet automatically. Many of the more prominent um, creators of Twitter bots have moved to Mastodon, a federated and uh, free open source software system. Um, but uh, people are still making new Twitter bots. The idea is to emit uh, text, usually, some of them make images, but the typical thing is that they create a textual output, and that appears in a social media context. So you see it as part of your feed, and um, while the earlier interfaces might be a teletype or a home computer, um, they're now uh, perhaps on a phone, or certainly on a uh, uh, very often a notebook or laptop computer, and uh, they occur in the context of uh, the other chatter and tweeting that one's uh, responding to and seeing. Um, people do interact with Twitter bots, not usually by saying something back to them, although some of them accept uh, such, uh, uh, such texts, but uh, they can like and retweet things. And so Allison Parrish's Every Word, which simply over many years uh, tweeted individually each word in the English language from a particular list, um, uh, had a lot of resonance with people who would find it funny to like particular words or retweet particular words. And you could see the popularity of different words in the English language in their context. Um, other examples, two headlines, Darius Kazemi's bot that uh, takes uh, contemporary headlines and conflates two of them together, often in a very amusing way. And as I said, they're still being made. So Leonardo Flores just made a Twitter bot using uh, a system called Cheatbots Done Quick called Taco Hell that has a, produces a fantasy menu from Taco Bell. Um, you can make your own bots as uh, people uh, have done and are still doing, and you can do it in uh, an easy to access system. You can write code in Python or Java. There's a book, Twitter Bots, from MIT Press that uh, explains how to do this in detail. And so these are possibilities, again, for getting engaged, getting under the hood, and seeing how these systems work uh, in order to appreciate them, and um, not just as an analyst or critic of digital media, not because you have an artistic practice in it, um, but uh, just as one of the ways that uh, you become part of a community, appreciating these types of works and understanding them. They are open um, in a way that uh, it's, it's not as easy to um, create a giant sculpture out of granite, um, but uh, these systems are things that are malleable and that people can easily access and work with. Um, my experience with Twitter bots um, is limited in terms of making them. I've only made one, uh, but they have been part of my um, Twitter feeds and uh, part of my Mastodon feed nowadays. And um, I had the uh, uh, pleasure of being part of the Bot Summit in 2016 and meeting many of the people who uh, created these systems. So um, 
these are different ways in which textual interfaces, uh, to me, are very lively and effective. Um, when you think of a text-based uh, display, you might uh, uh, look at the system and say, oh, the, the computer has crashed. That's what it means when I see all text on my screen. Um, but uh, the exchange of texts from the days of Eliza through interactive fiction and text adventures up to um, the widespread use of text in uh, microblogging context like uh, Twitter and Mastodon um, gives us the opportunity to do things that are conversational in nature um, and to engage with uh, language and literary art in special and different ways. I'd, be lo I'd love to hear some about your experiences with these different systems and uh, what surprised you about them and um, also welcome any questions you have for me. Thanks.